special Wednesday edition of the Compound uh, presents. What are your thoughts? My name is Josh Brown. For those of you new to the show, my co-host is Michael Batnick. And hey guys. every week, <laughs> give him a Forrest Gump. Hey guys, yeah, let's go. And every week, Michael and I talk about the biggest topics that we think are affecting markets, investors. We have a lot of fun producing the show, forces us to do a lot of research and really confirm and reconfirm our own opinions. And I uh, want to welcome everyone for, uh, who's watching the show for the first time. For our day ones, quick shout outs, Cliff Peebles. Dave Wilson, Roger is here, Brian Grill, uh, let's see, Triple Levered All Cash, welcome, Michael is here, uh, T. Newman, got a, a Kelly S. Epp is in the house, all the, all the regulars are here, and we love that you guys are coming here live and making the chat hilarious, and yes, I am definitely multitasking, watching the chat while we go through the show, and we appreciate all of your comments and jokes and compliments. Uh, about our respective wardrobes. Would you agree, Mike? Uh, I would. All right, listen, we have a sponsor. Guess what? It's us. It's us. Ooh. We, we're we not just, and us, it's Red Hulls Wealth Management. We have a How day How much job. are we paying for this? We're not right, just, ahead. we're not just uh, amazing at content. We also have, <laughs> we also have world-class financial advisors and a world-class operational team and world-class traders and, and, if you would like to learn about working with us, well, you know where to find us. But even better than that, we're coming to Chicago, oh, yeah. March 6th through the 8th. Josh, I'm going to be there. Are you going to be there? I'm going. Everyone's going. Tadas is going. Ben. Uh, the whole the whole Ritholtz crew is showing up. And um, we're posting up. We're seeing existing clients. We decided to carve out space for potential clients. And if you think that's you... Give us a shout, info at RitholtzWealth.com, subject line Chicago. By and the way, you know we say like, oh, no, it's filling up. No, literally, Chris just slacked me the schedule, and it literally is filling up. So if you'd like to meet with us, we'd love right, to see you. but if it. somebody from the pound reaches out, we're going to make it happen. We'll make an okay. exception. Let's, Let's go. Uh, All right, I'm starting. I'm starting. Okay. I'm starting. So we're going to start with – this show might go long, so stick around. Grab a, grab a coffee. Uh, <laughs> we're going to start with – we're going to start with earnings because we got a, a, a flurry. Coffee. I always said co- coffee. Uh, a cocktail, maybe. It's a flurry. We got a flurry, a barrage. It's a barrage of earnings after the close. We're going to start with Robinhood. Let's go through some charts. Mm. All right. So they're not really growing, which is certainly not a surprise to probably anyone, right? They pulled forward a lot of users and they're flatlining, which is not so terrible, I don't think, the fact that they're flatlining. Um, but what's bad is the next chart. The monthly active users, so the people that are actually involved and engaged, are at their lowest level since they went public? Before they went public. Long time. I can't believe it. You're, is anyone <laughs> surprised by this? No, of course not. They gave us gu- they gave guidance. Um, the hey, average... You- yeah. I'll finish. Give me more. Yeah, we're almost done. The average revenue per user uh, is actually going the right way. But the problem is, the problem is, next chart, I believe that most of this is being driven by uh, interest rates, right? So they're like, a, they're like a bank. They're just making yeah. the spreads. So total net revenues were $380 million, up 5% sequentially, primarily driven by higher net interest revenues. What do we mean by that? Look at the next chart. So I don't think that the market is going to give them any credit for this because who knows where rates are going to be on a go-forward basis. Um, but there's some good stuff going on. So next chart, please. Their costs were absolutely out of control, particularly the stock-based comp. So they're getting that in order. Their expenses are going down. The stock-based comp is still way too high, but whatever. They're they're riding the ship. And then lastly, their net loss was uh, you know, it's going in the right direction. So not all not all bad, certainly not all great. The stock's only up four percent in the after hours, and it's not really that much that far off the lows. Uh, so yeah, that's the story. It's the dumbest thing I ever saw. The reason why they're saying the stock is up four percent in the after hours. Did you see what this? Are they saying? I did not say it. They're saying Robinhood got permission from itself to repurchase the shares in FTX that uh, Sam Bankman Slob bought, um, which is hilarious because the board giving itself permission to do that repurchase, they're like, oh, this, this demonstrates confidence on the part of the board. It's like, first of all, these shares in Robinhood are like the subject of nine different lawsuits. So I wish you the best of luck throwing your hat in the ring. These shares have been promised to like five different entities. 
uh, everyone thinks they rightfully own these shares. The government of the Bahamas, uh, probably U.S. regulators who are going to uh, pr- probably uh, probably the, the, the committee that's been appointed to go through the bankruptcy would like to have these shares so they can give the FTX shareholders something. BlockFi thinks they're owed the, the shares. A whole handful of other promises that were made by Alameda and or SBF. But so the stock is rallying apparently on news that Robinhood's going to repurchase this 7.6% stake in its own company. Um, best of luck. And if that's the reason it's up, I would be. Uh, I don't I think that's the reason it's up. It was, it, it, that's it, what the it, headline said. No. Well, okay. So and headline, I only believe headlines. Oh, the headlines. Oh, the headlines. All right. So let's just move <laughs> on. No, no, no. It popped right after earnings, and it's given it's given a lot of it back. That's not why it's up. Can I tell I mean, you, can we put up that chart, John, where it showed, like, the decline in, in users? There we yeah, go. Yeah, perfect. Well Look done, John. John is so good, Jeez. dude. John is low-key uh, an assassin. <laughs> Here's the problem. Here's why your user base looks like this, because you ab- abused your your users. So you built a huge base of users during the pandemic. Take this, take this off. You built this huge base of users during the pandemic. You had a lot of a, a big tailwind at your back. You had no sports on TV, nothing for people to bet on, no action. You were the only game in town. You were giving out leverage. You were letting people trade options and do all sorts of reckless things with no experience that the other brokerage firms weren't doing. And there was a social viral component of this. So everyone's sitting at home and their friend sends them this app and says, hey, this is what I do all day. What do you do all day? And that was great. The problem is you didn't really build an investing platform. You stood up a casino and you called it a brokerage firm and you encouraged all of the worst behavior because that was the big payout uh, for your real client, which is Citadel. And Citadel's securities unit, not the hedge fund, but the unit that is literally scalping Robinhood people for a living, did $7.5 billion last year in revenue. That money is coming uh, directly as a consequence of all the shitty trading that Robinhood's customers spent the year doing, and I don't think that should be lost on anyone. So the moral of the story, anytime you hear we're democratizing blank, hold your wallet or run out of the room. So when this guy's like, oh, we democratized investing. No, you didn't, you fucking chimpanzee. What you did was you built a casino and you crushed a lot of kids and there is no democracy. I democratized investing. Me. I wrote this book. This came out in 2012. I told you where all the bodies were buried on Wall Street. I was telling you about SPACs. I was telling you about churning. I was... I did, I did it, me, the democratizer, me. This is the book that democratized. Not you, you, you sold your clients to Citadel, literally fed them to a hedge fund in Chicago. There's no democracy. So that's why your user base looks like that. No, no, it's never going to be okay. It's not okay. It's not, it's never, I I published, I, I literally, I said, this is how they, this is how they fuck you over and over and over again. And the genius of Robin Hood, there was nobody in a pinstripe suit on the other side. You fucked yourself. You did it to yourself. You opened the account and you gambled all your money away. They, they didn't even need to be a boiler room broker or uh, the vampire squid at Goldman. You did it. All right, so, good tirade. I, I think that, yes, you have helped democratize investing. I think Jack no, Bogle. No, I pop- did, literally did it. Okay, well, I think Jack Bogle. Could hold that throw, no offense. All right, fine. Me, Jack Bogle, maybe a handful <laughs> of other people. It's All right, a, shush for a sec. It's a short list. Shush for a sec. It's, that, that was a good tirade, and uh, it was a good time because my mic went out, so that was a good timing. All right, but there's more data. Do you data want me to do you. more? Do you no, want no, to just on. make sure it's working? Okay. More, more. Do I want to do what? You want to do more fixing with the mic? Like I could do more. I could stretch. One, one last thing. So they've got their transaction-based revenue. So the biggest component of the $186 million. So I'll just read it to you. It's 39 million in crypto, down from a high of 233 million at the peak. So 39 million is crypto. Uh, 21 million is, are stocks, right? Because I guess it's commission free. So where is even, I don't know. Uh, maybe the, maybe the, uh, the, the kickback type stuff. 
butt options out of <laughs> the walk. Is kickback a line payment item? Payment for or, the, the PFOF, you know, whatever, same thing. Um, payment for order flow. So out of the $186 million in revenue, yeah. $124 million of it was options. <clears throat> Can't so it. it's a casino, and we know it. And guess what? Uh, I like the casino. I have fun at the casino, but I understand your point. It's obviously- Oh, I don't- I have no problem. Keep doing it. Like, keep the casino open. Stop saying you're an investing platform. It makes me want to throw up. Well, hang on, hang on. You're you're right because they did say that most of their investor, most of their investors uh, are lo- most of their users are long term investors. I mean, don't bullshit a bullshitter. Come on, bullshit. All right. All right. Show me evidence of that. Yeah, yeah. Next. All right. Let's move on. Let's move on to Disney. So this was a delight. We've got Bobby Iger back, uh, back at the helm. It was his first earnest call since Chapek was thrown out for bombing the last one. And as a Disney shareholder, I was very pleased with the results, very pleased to have Bob back at the helm, and I was very pleased to listen to this live on the quarter app. This was delightful. Mm. I was listening in live. So here's what Mr. Iger said. After a solid first quarter, we are embarking on a significant transformation, one that will maximize the potential of our world-class creative terms, uh, teams I'm sorry, and our unparalleled brands and franchises. We believe the work that we are doing to reshape our company around creativity while reducing expenses will lead to sustained growth and profitability for our streaming businesses, better positioned to us to weather future disruption and global economic challenges, and deliver value to our shareholders. This call was about two things. One, they're restructuring the business, but most importantly, very similar to Facebook, it was all about Wall Street. It was all about getting to profitability on Disney Plus by 2024, reducing expenses, reducing expenses, efficiency. They reinstated a dividend. Like yeah. they are, they are going after, not after Wall Street. They're trying to, to play nice. So let's get into some of the segment stuff. Um, all right. The, the, the parks is, was up 21%. Uh, uh, record this, what tra- is this stock doing in the after hours? This it's is up a like big 6%. move. It's up 6%. Yeah. It was up 8 That's at a one big point. move for Disney, right? Uh, yes, it is. So the park, okay, up 20%. It was record uh, prices, record, uh, record uh, uh, foot traffic or whatever, attendance. Uh, the, the media division, linear network was bad. It was down 5%, but it was all international. It was like all international. Uh, mm. So that decline's not so bad. Uh, of course, it's not really growing, but it wasn't so bad. Uh, Disney Plus is shrinking a little bit, 164 million to 161.8. So that wasn't great, but expenses are getting, the losses are, are, I think the loss was $200 million better than they, than they got it for when Chapek was at the helm. I think they uh, had to go crazy in the first three years on new content for the app. They did. Just to, just to get everyone's eyes on it, and now they can slow down, look at what's working, what's not. They don't have to spend that much on an annual basis anymore. So Disney Plus in the U.S. and Canada is not really growing, um, but they you know they got to 100 million really quick, really quick. All right, um, let's move on to, uh, to, to, to Uber. Can I say one thing on, can I say one thing sure. on Disney? They're also doing the layoff thing. Um, which is hot, right? So hot right now. But like uh, Iger's, like Iger's success, a lot of it boils down to like the big swings that he's taken on things like Marvel and Star Wars, and obviously he like saw something there that Disney could do with those assets, and nobody else would have paid as much, or nobody else would have been able to do as much. I think a lot of people are like, okay, you're cleaning it up. We're we're gonna focus on the financials. All the stuff that everyone's telling these media communications platforms to do, and then what? Like, what's the big swing? Like, I still think people want him to be aggressive here. Well, so maybe, they, not, not, maybe not this year, but eventually. They bought 21st Century Fox. Avatar was a, was a massive home run. So they wish, there, there's three verticals now. It's ESPN, media, which is Disney and everything else, and uh, the parks. So, um, can I tell you something? I watched uh, Black Panther 2 this week. How was it? <laughs> yeah. It's not. I mean, they missed. They don't miss usually. The Marvel they, movies but, have sucked. I'm. I'm very excited for Ant Man. I'm a big Ant Man guy. They missed on the last. I'm going in like no expectations. The last Thor movie was unwatchable. Yeah, it wasn't good. Like, but Quantum Mania is going to be good. Ant Man's going to be good. They've been missing. Is all yeah, I'm saying. They have so. been. Um. All right. Uber. So this is interesting. Uh. Let's start with the thread, actually, John. Let's start with the thread. So friends at Quarter put this together for us. Uh, new driver counts is up thirty four percent. Wait, you're are you in Disney? I am. I bought it a All couple right. weeks. You're ago. not an Uber though, are you? No, no, no. I know you okay. are. I'm in, I'm an Uber. I'm not in. Uber. Di- I wish I was in Disney. Okay, go. Um, they're they're saying they're citing inflation. Uh, let's keep it rolling. 
Uh, what's in here? Can I can I just talk yeah. about this? We don't, we don't need we don't need the scroll. Here's the story. We did this really childish thing um, in the aftermath of the pandemic, where we bucketed stocks in two groups. We said these are the work from home, stay at home stocks, pandemic plays, and then these are the reopen plays. And Uber was both all along. And if you put it in the work from home because they have. Uh, because they have Uber Eats. No, I thought it was, um, a, it was a reopening play. But Mike, they do more revenue. They do more platform revenue on Eats than rides right now. I don't know if you know that. It's a bigger business. Um, but but anyway, it it got bucketed with the unprofitable tech companies that were going after a TAM, losing money, uh, work from home, pandemic hangover. Like it was with all those stocks. Okay, so why is but, that childish? Because it's because. There's no company other than five or six that really perfectly fit into that basket. What Uber was doing during the pandemic was biding their time for the rides business to come back. And then once it did, now they have both businesses. They have the stay at home, whatever stuff going on. But the bigger business in the future is going to be rides and freight. And that stuff now is all very close to profitability. They are talking about an operating profit this year in 2023. And within two years, they'll be doing $50 billion a year based on Wall Street's analyst expectations. That would be wild. I don't think it'll be a $60 billion market cap when they're doing $50 billion a year profitably. I, I think the stock is, is way right, John, undervalued. Slide three. I want to show – so this, this surprised me. Ride share and penetration is – I don't know what I would have guessed if you asked me. John, what do you, what do you guess it is? Ride share penetration? What, is, what, do, what do you mean by that? So I guess how many potential users are using it? Well, they have 131 million people using Uber. So, uh, so I don't know exactly how they measure this, but according to them, it's 3.7%. The average weekly active consumer penetration seems pretty I low. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where they're, where they're deriving the, 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 the top number that they think they'll grow into. Um, but I, I would just tell you, any platform that has 131 million paying customers, and this is a distinction that's important. When Twitter says we have 100-something million, nobody's paying them anything. Everyone on Uber is paying something. So when you have 131 million people paying you every month, you are a substantial business. And Slide I think that got lost in the shuffle. So Dara was like the first one, the first big mega CEO to say, okay, the game has changed. Right, yeah. the street is now valuing cash flow and profitability. So slide seven shows uh, that they're getting close. They're yeah, getting close. No, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna happen, and it's something that a lot of the bears looked at, like especially the delivery food business, and they said this will never be profitable on a conventional basis. The thing is that when interest rates were at zero, there was a lot more competition. There were a lot more people saying, "Oh, we'll deliver food." Also, now that there's a cost to capital. And Uber is already beating the shit out of Lyft and rides. They're not going to have a lot of competition for delivery either at some point. They will choke off whoever's left. And that's like a, an underrated piece of the story. Uber got big enough so that they can live through higher rates and a higher cost of capital. A lot of their potential competitors just didn't make it. I did not know that their advertising business is this big now. Uh, they're at a run rate of over $500 million. Yeah, why wouldn't they do it? Oh, one last thing on this. They, they had a negative operating profit in Q4, but they had a positive overall earnings per share number. Actually, it was a blowout. That came from writing up a lot of these investments that they've been making around the world. They've sold off a bunch of stuff. They got a piece of Didi because they took their China operation and merged it. Uh, and Didi now has a positive value. Um, the Chinese government is no longer whipping it. Uh, with a garden hose in the backyard, they're actually going to let that company survive. And Uber is like an investor there. So they said they're going to sell it off at some point. It's not core. But the point is like a lot of things that people thought were zeros are not really zeros anymore. And that's All right, last thing example. before we get into the first topic. By the way, this, is, this, this episode is like The Departed where they play the credits 20 <laughs> minutes into the movie. Uh, so Affirm is pro one of the first stocks that I've seen to lay off 90% of its staff and the stock tanked. Uh, yeah, I thought so we liked layoffs. Layoffs have been really great for stocks, but I guess I haven't looked into this one yet. But anyway, all right, topic one. Topic one. Um, 
I don't. I don't even know where we are in well, the back with like it's nine me. pages it's deep. Me. It's oh, me. go ahead. All right. Um, I've made. I've shown this chart in the past. One of the diff most difficult things about bear markets are the rallies along the way that fizzle out. They're just absolutely backbreaking. So let's just go through this. This is this is the tech bubble. The red line is the drawdown, the percent from high, and the black line are all of the bounces that fail along the way. So when the black line reverts down to zero, that's a new low. Okay, so that was the dot-com bubble. You had a similar a similar experience during the great financial crisis where all of these false rallies that just faded, uh, absolutely backbreaking. And And here, let's show where we are today. So, uh, you know, was, was October the bottom? Maybe, maybe not. But there's been some really nasty whipsaws along the way. Look at all these bounces that failed. This is the reason why it's so backbreaking is because the bear market rallies are often the thing that induces people who have been waiting to say, oh, man, I can't wait anymore. This thing's the real thing. Like, that, for, like at least from my perspective, that's the thing that really kills you when you get an S&P up 17% and then it falls to a lower low. So it doesn't happen a lot, but when that happens, it just like makes you want to never invest again. Well, if you know this I mean? one, if we take out the October 2022 20, lows, From it'll here? be the same thing. Yeah, it'll be the same thing. That's what, that, is that the percentage decline that it will represent? Uh, I don't know. No, I'm just saying we had. It'll be it'll another 17. Same. It'll be another 17 percent rally that fails. Now this one's lasted a little bit longer, uh, but we'll see. The jury's still out. Yeah, when when we were doing the show at when we were doing the show at the Nasdaq with uh, Danny Moses, th this is what he was saying. He's saying you're gonna you're probably gonna rally to start the year because things were so bad this year. But then when when we ha start heading back toward those October lows, it's gonna feel even worse than the first oh. time. That's going to be and horrible. I, I could see it. I I'm going to say I it's going to. It, it. If it happens, it will It will feel, it'll be nausea, nausea it, inducing. It All right, let's move on because we, we just spent a bunch of time on the. All right. Uh, we have the next bubble. So if you were, if you were like wondering, will we ever have a bubble in speculative tech ever again, given all the carnage of stocks and Bitcoin and IPOs and EVs? Well, we're back on our bullshit. And in 2023, the bubble of the year is going to be or is currently AI. And I actually think it should be like this. If if you're going to get ridiculously excited about something, this is probably the thing that you should get ridiculously excited about. Not lithium stocks like this is this is the this is the thing to lose your mind over much more so than crypto, much more so than a lot of the other things that have come along over the last few years. So. I did oppose the AI bubble of 2023. I don't want to regurgitate the whole thing, but I do want to highlight what I think was really interesting, which was commentary from an analyst at UBS who was basically saying that this is the fastest adoption, chat GPT in particular, the fastest adoption he's ever seen for any platform um, related to his universe. Um, so this is from Barron's UBS analyst Lloyd Wamsley points out the suddenly wildly popular natural chat language chatbot ChatGPT uh, on pace to surpass 100 million monthly active users in January, up from 57 million in December. He notes it took TikTok nine months from launch to reach 100 million. Um, Instagram, it took two and a half years. We quote, we cannot remember an app scaling at this pace. Um, now. What does this mean financially? Again, this is UBS. Who knows if this is what ends up happening? Uh, venture capital investors speculate the market for generative AI applications could be as large as $1 trillion. He notes the world has over 1 billion knowledge workers. OpenAI charges 42 a month for the professional version of ChatGPT. If you assume every one of so those cheap. people gets two accounts, one general and one specialized, you get close to a trillion dollars. That's quite an assumption. But that is how Wall Street is now starting to think about generative AI. And what makes it a bubble, the, the way these things become a bubble, and I want, I want your take on this, is that in the early stages, it feels like anything is possible and no amount is too much to pay to get in. And there's usually only four or five stocks. So, John, do we have these? Uh, we have these stocks. I made this chart. I apologize. Um, I do my best analytics in Comic Sans. Um, these are the only three pure plays that are not like literal penny stocks. 
Um, C3.ai Incorporated has the right ticker. AI. It's not a bullshit company. It's got like hundreds of millions in revenue. Um, but you can see that the stock start uh, the last two months since ChatGPT came out is up 130%. Um, SoundHound, which sounds like a bullshit company, but also actually has a business and customers. Um, I think the stock was up 40% today. Uh, I think we have an updated chart. It, it, like I wrote about this the other day, and the stock went up another 40%. And then there's something called Big Bear, which is also has AI in the name. And that stock, don't even look at a chart of what that thing has done. Um, what's, where's the updated chart? That's this? Okay. Yeah, so we, we are basically in a situation where the ETFs don't work for if you want to play AI. Take this off. Um, because they have like IBM and Intel and all this other shit in them. So you really have like three stocks, four stocks, and the, and the, um, the IPO machine hasn't given us enough. So these are going to be the stocks. What are your thoughts? I think you're absolutely right about that. These stocks are going to be like the meme stocks of 2021. I think it's a little bit early to call it a bubble because first of all, and maybe this is true of previous bubbles, but this thing launched when? In December? November 30th. Okay. And immediately you use it and you were like, whoa, like it wasn't a promise of one day down the road it would I deliver. Agree. It's sick. It is super sick to the point where you can't even get on it. Every time I go on ChatGPT, it says it's at capacity right now. Like almost every time I go on there. Um, and then uh, a bubble, uh, I think it probably will be a bubble, but I don't know if it's a bubble right now. Put the technology aside. We're talking about investments related to the technology. Here's, here's George Soros. Yeah, how big are these stocks though? Hold on, it's fucking tiny. Yeah. I have developed, but getting bigger. I have developed a theory about boom bust processes or bubbles along these lines. Every bubble has two components, an underlying trend that prevails in reality and a misconception relating to that trend. You can believe both things to be true. Number one, chat GPT is amazing and revolutionary and is going to spur a very big investment cycle in AI. That's one thing you could believe. Second thing you believe is the current investment options I have to pl play AI are not good investments. And we see that time and time and time again. So it doesn't mean these stocks are terrible, but it does mean they're really expensive. They've gone up a lot. And right now they're the only game in town. And that's not, that doesn't usually lead to good investment so outcomes over two the long term. One, uh, Duncan tells me that he owns uh, SoundHound. And the bear one, does. and the bear one. Duncan, you own two out of three. Okay, um, so big big bear has a market. Cap I own of, none of the, I own none of these. I'm not short. I'm not long. No, big no bear position. has a market cap of 680 million. Soundhound is 915 million, and C3 is 2.8 billion. So these are these are tiny, and I agree. There's no reason. There's no reason why these can't uh, triple in the next uh, three yeah, weeks. Them up. Not a, hey, yeah. uh, Sound, SoundCloud is um, uh, Soundhound is like like an existing thing where companies want to have an AI chatbot that has a voice and makes you feel like you're in a conversation with it. So you speak into a phone and you're talking to some company and like their customer service and SoundHound is pa powering it and it's real. So I don't mean to demean the company. I don't know what it's worth. Uh, it probably shouldn't go up 40% a day. Uh, but like it's it's an actual business that exists. Let's and talk. Corporations are using it. All right, let's talk about about bubbles a little bit on the show with I think I don't know if it was Jason or Nathan. I think it was Nathan talking about like which was the bigger bubble, two thousand or the most recent one. And I made the case pretty v uh, vehemently that two thousand was a bigger bubble. And what I meant by it is perfectly described in this next chart. So this is this is from the Ludhold Group. And I said that there was so much more, uh, it was everywhere. The bubble was everywhere. And there was just more companies that were IPOing and go up 300% a day. Like we didn't really have that. However, what we did have was a bigger bubble in the sense that the companies that got stupidly valued were $130 billion in the case of Zoom or whatever it was. So again, in 2000, you had more of them, as you can see in the red line. But today they were much, much, much larger. This is, this is the number of companies that had a price to sales ratio over 15. I also think that you made the right, leave this up, John. You, you made the right point. My point was the dollar amounts were bigger. 
And they were, but not by much. But your point of the length of it, I like. I think I think two thousand one was very self contained inside of basically one year. Like the the party really went went nuts. Let's say at the end of twenty twenty, and then by the fall of twenty twenty one, it was over. Like yeah, the Netscape bubble kicked it, kicked it off in ninety five. Like it went le- legitimately for five yeah, years. Yeah, so I think there's something to be said because you know what happens. We were in. Think about it. SNL did a skit with Pete Davidson playing a meme stock trader in January of 2021 and all of America was laughing at how stupid it was. Yeah. Like, so in other words, like we were laughing at that bubble as it was taking place in the late nineties, there was substantial belief, number one. And number two, it went on long enough and proliferated far and wide enough that like, uh, it crossed over into pop culture in a much more meaningful way. Where, like people believing in this new paradigm. Like I don't think the 2021 thing really had the chance to do that. So I do think the dot-com bubble is up there with the Nikkei as like the mother of all speculative bubbles. I think it still keeps its crown. And everyone has their favorites. You know, some people prefer the 2020, some, whatever. I get it. There t- I know Tulip guys. Yeah, for sure. everyone, <laughs> everyone has their preferred bubble. Uh, let, I just want to talk about two more, two more valuation charts. This is from BMO, Brian Belsky. Uh, we're looking at, again, uh, the bubble then versus, I guess, the bubble recently. And what we're looking at is the S&P 500. So a lot of bubble things are not in the S&P 500. We're looking at the average Z-score of the PE, the next, the, the forward PE, price of book, price of sales. And anyway, I think what's really interesting is how much has come out of the most recent episode. Like, look how far we've, we've, we've fallen. So this is a valuation composite going back to 1990. So you can say like in the modern era, typically this is like where, not that stocks ever sit there for long, but this is like roughly fair value. Um, is that, is that like the right way to think about it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they don't spend much time there, but that's mm -mm, the average. Never. And we got Uh, right to the average. They're either way above or way below or heading Swinging past them. Uh, last chart. This is from Alpha Architect. So what this is showing is it's a little bit confusing, but we're looking at the 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 top decile of value. So the cheapest ten percent of value, based on uh, earnings before interest and tax versus a total enterprise value. And this isn't showing that the market is so expensive. It's actually inverted. What this is showing is the 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 cheapest decile relative to the rest of the market is as cheap as it's ever been. The blue line is the S and P. Um, and the gray line is IFA. So again, the cheapest stocks are as cheap as they've ever been relative to the market ever. So I don't know exactly what's in here, but yeah, I want to know what those stocks are. Just curious. Yeah. Like, especially I don't know. after this bounce that we've had, I don't know, but uh, even still, uh, pretty unbelievable stuff. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I agree. Skip shout, out, shout out Belsky, shout out alpha architect. Um, this comes from Ari Wald, uh, our friend, Ari Wald. Ari is, I think, one of the, the better technicians working on Wall Street. Uh, he's at Oppenheimer, and I think he does really interesting, insightful work. Um, and I wanted to highlight three of his charts, and these were from the weekend. I don't think anything really this week invalidated any of it because uh, he's, he's talking about longer-term trends. Um, so let me just go through his words, not mine, of what we're seeing here because I think this is going to be notable for the full year 2023. He's showing us a breakout in MSCI All Country World Index XUS. So this is everything else. And he's saying that that is additional evidence that uh, global market breakaway is developing. Um, and I think, this is, I think this is important because the last, the last real years of like pre-pandemic globally coordinated bull markets. 17. Uh, 17 was really powerful, that rally. And... I don't like it wasn't all S&P outperforming, although the S&P did. Um, But he's making the case that world equities have only outperformed versus a falling S&P 500 in 17 percent of all rolling 52 week periods since 1988. So if you're bullish on international, you kind of also have to be bullish on the S&P because it's it it would be very, very rare. Again, less than 20 percent of the time where you'd have the S&P falling and international stocks rocking and rolling. So I wouldn't take this as an either or. I guess is how I'm. Do you know what I'm happened today? Away from this, the FTSE Please. 100, which is Britain's version of the S and P or the Dow or whatever, hit an all-time high, all-time closing yeah. high. How about that? Yeah, 
They got the right stocks in, in the FTSE. They got mining stocks. They got industrials, banks. Uh, they're, they're in all the right places. This is broadening global breakaway. Put this one up, John. Um, don't expect, even if you're a bull, uh, don't expect a straight line. Investors should be thinking in terms of buying weakness rather than selling strength. Um, we're encouraged the number of NYSE net new 52-week highs has reached its highest level in over a year. This indicates an expanding number of stocks are breaking through resistance at their August peak. Um, so that is an internal tailwind, according to Ari. Uh, and you can, you can kind of see the bottom chart, the bottom pane, expanding number of breakouts still above that August resistance. That is a positive. That's not a top. That's not indicative of a rally that's about to stop. This is actually what you want to see as confirmation of what we're seeing in price. You want to see the internals uh, continue to improve. And the last one here. There's a lot of talk about leadership, and Mike, you and I talked about this uh, on the show. Does it matter if the biggest stocks lead or fall or are flat? Um, this is Ari. Since October, our basis for a textbook market bottom was that mega cap weakness was weighing on the cap weighted benchmarks and masking improving internal breadth. Now the equal weighted S and P 500 has broken above August resistance, and you're getting renewed strength in the mega cap stocks, uh, which pulls that headwind off. So the combination has resulted in this broad based market breakaway. Um, specifically looking at Apple, Google, Microsoft are back above their 200 day. Oh, forget about uh, Google, but yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Well, Google had a shitty day, which we kind of talked about a little bit. Um, but yeah. It, I've it got is, two more what, charts that I want to add. Uh, the percentage of S&P 500 stocks above their 200 day uh, doesn't really get that much better than this, right? We were up to 80%. And then the percentage of S&P 500 stocks at a 50 day high, again, Prior, uh, absent the the March 2020 bottom, it really doesn't get much better than 40% of stocks at a new 50-day high. So I think to the point that Ari was making, um, I think some backing and filling here is probably expected and probably normal. I don't think anybody wants to see the SP go up 6% next week. Yeah, so a 5% pullback, given how overbought some of the internals are. It's great. I don't know about overbought, but overheated. Some of the internals, it's like... You should be expecting that at this point. Maybe yeah. we're already seeing the start of that. Yep. All right. I want to talk about retail traders because they're back, sticking with the, the Robin Hood theme. They never left. Well, they never left. They were dormant. And as soon as stocks started to go up, uh, they they reengaged. All right. So I just want to give a shout to – what are you laughing at? What are you it laughing reminds, at? It reminds you. Hey, Mortimer, we're back in business. We're back. We're back. Well, Randolph, we're back yeah. in business. All right. Uh, so Jamie Catherwood did a really awesome post on Liberty Bonds, which I didn't know. Uh, you did it? Was, did you read my book? Uh, I forget. Yeah, I read it ten years ago. You're old. I did a whole. I did a whole chapter in my, my book okay, about the birth of the retail investor. Okay. So, so this is from Jamie's post. Historians estimate that in 1910 the United States had 0.81 million shareholders. But by 1932, that figure had risen to 10 to 12 million. That dramatic increase was fueled in part, large part by the Liberty Bonds. So when those bonds matured, they put it into the market. Anyway, that was a great read. I suggest you read it. But they're back. They are back. So this is from JP Morgan. The retail trading orders as a percentage of volume have surpassed the 2021 meme mania peak. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I believe this. Uh, I have to look. I have to look more closely at it. I don't know if I believe this. Okay. I have. A, I, I'm not sure. I got to. Uh, I got to look at what J, J. P. Morgan is. Um. I want to read Jamie's piece, but like basically, the Liberty Bonds paid out because we won the war. <laughs> yeah. If you look at look at the origin of all the white shoe firms like like Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Like we uh, <laughs> we won the war, so the government paid. Like the bonds matured, and then like Merrill Lynch was looking around. I was like, wait a minute, yeah, we have what, yeah. two million people sitting with cash, dude. It was. I think inflation adjusted. <laughs> you better was, sell them something. It was over five trillion dollars worth of bonds. Yeah. So, uh, all right, listen to this. Hold on to your your britches. What the hell does that mean? What's a what does that mean? What? What does one like, mean? Like that phrase, hold on to your britches? That's not a phrase. You just made that up. Okay. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. I had a fight with Chris today because he kept, we was in a meeting and he kept talking. He was talking about our advisor, Kevin, 
And yeah. he kept going, uh, Kevin lives up in Western Connecticut. And he said Western Connecticut eight times. And finally, I was like, on Slack later, I'm like, why do you keep saying that? It's not, there's no Western Connecticut. That's not a phrase that anybody from Connecticut uses. There's no cowboys. Like, why, no. why are we saying Western Connecticut? I saw, I'm, trying, yeah, you're right. me crazy. I don't know where I got that phrase from, but breeches or breeches are pants used in riding horses, meaning hold on it's to your hold pants. Hold on to your horses. Oh, that's what it is. Hold, oh, hold your horses. All right. So anyway, you're about to hold your horses. Now we're totally, I lost the plot. But do you know that there's something called zero days to option expirations? To Tell expiration options? Do you know about this? No. Okay. You're about to. So Thursday, this is from Peter Tachir. Look at this chart. Thursday saw the heaviest call option trading ever recorded. And one of the reasons why the VIX is so fucked up is because people aren't trading options that expire. What I don't know what the window, 20, 30, 23 to 37 days, something like that. So zero days to, to expirations are literally options contracts with less than one day to expiration. Same day, basically. You buy them, they expire. People are going nuts for this. Is it, are they making money? I mean, somebody is. Yes, yeah, Citadel is. You know what this is like? Zero days. This is like how you can't watch a, an NBA game now without somebody telling you in the middle of the game that the odds just moved and you should put a bet in. Like, all right, fourth quarter on top. Do you have your bet in? Like, that's I'm what this is. Guilty. <laughs> I love in-game betting. <laughs> I know you're doing it. Everyone's doing it. These, co these companies are making a ton of money, apparently. So anyway, so this is... So this is this mimicking is that. This is like a real thing. Zero days to expiration options. I mean, we'll hear more about this in the coming weeks, but uh, just some wild, wild stuff. All right, State of the Union. I did not watch. I have no thoughts. I didn't listen. I don't. I didn't read the the reviews. What happened? Tell us. I like that you're staying on top of this stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. Thought, yeah. No, I didn't have anything to do today except for I read the State of the Union nonsense. What'd you What'd you do last night? You didn't watch it last. I was night? on an airplane. Were you Were you doing uh, uh, zero day options or did they have? TV? No, what I watched. What. Kramer versus Kramer. I'll have thoughts okay. tomorrow. Well, that's, that's, that's timely. All right. Anyway, there were three things that I think are relevant to our discussion. The first is they want to quadruple the tax on stock buybacks. And you know what? Oh. They'll probably be able to because the jet, it doesn't, you could write a 9,000 word essay on why mm -hmm. buybacks aren't doesn't matter. evil. Doesn't it doesn't matter. matter. The doesn't public matter. thinks they're fucked up. Yeah. The public thinks it's yet another way that people who are already rich preserve their status as rich people and expand their uh, advantage over everyone else. So you could you could scream and cry and compare them to dividends. Well, how about this? Companies, companies that are issuing all the stock to C-suite C executives and then buying back the stock to offset it, fine. Tax those people. So they did a 1% surcharge on, I don't think they call it a surcharge, on buybacks, and it didn't stop anything. Apple uh, did $95.6 billion the following year, which was up from $92 billion. Alphabet's buyback rose 28%. Meta's rose 45%. Uh, look, is ExxonMobil's buyback went up 10,395%. What so, would happen? It didn't what matter. Would happen, what would happen if they banned buybacks? What, what would Apple do with $1.3 trillion worth of cash? Well, so in the Democrats' minds, this is I'm not saying it's good, it's bad. I'm just telling you, this is not political. The Democrats think that if the oil companies weren't so busy paying out hundreds of billions of dollars in dividend in uh, buybacks, which they did last year, right, or, or making hundreds of billions of dollars, they think that oil prices and gas prices would be lower because they'd be plowing more money into Stop, infrastructure. Well, of course they wouldn't, because the same Democratic administration is also telling them we want you to disappear and go to zero. All right, what else? And we want what your else? assets to be worthless. What else? What else? Uh, billionaire's tax. President, this is coming from the White House's site, so nobody accused me of um, uh, misconstruing what, what Biden is talking about. President Biden's billionaire minimum income tax will make America's tax code fairer and reduce the deficit by $360 billion in the next decade. The minimum tax will require America's wealthiest households to pay as they go. So it's a thousand people in America it, have a billion won't do dollars. Anything, it won't do anything to the deficit, but what do they want to well, do? What is the tax? The, the minimum income tax will ensure that the very wealthiest Americans pay a tax rate of at least 20% on their full income, including unrealized appreciation. Good luck. Well, that's uh, dumb. This minimum tax would make sure that they no longer pay a tax rate lower than teachers and firefighters. Okay, also canard, but fine. The tax will apply only to the top one 
one hundredth of one percent of American households, um, those worth over a hundred million dollars, over half of the revenue will come from households worth more than a billion. If a wealthy household already pays twenty percent on their full income, they're good. Uh, then they will pay no additional tax under this proposal. However, if tax-free, unrealized income— So it's for, it's, it's for Steve Schwartzman. Like, that's who it's for. Yeah, and you know what? Fine, and you know I'm what? fine with that. Do it, and you know who's going to make more money? All the accounting firms. Yeah. <laughs> all the same, all the law firms. I agree. Like, the carried interest is total nonsense. Uh, the unrealized gains, uh, the unrealized, that's a horrible idea. Horrible, horrible idea. But other than that, I'm okay with that. What else? Amer- I think America's okay. The last thing was really embarrassing. There was a fossil fuel related gaffe. And this is the problem. Biden went off script. Like everyone gets a copy of his speech before he gives it. He kind of did like a little ad living. And he's like, you know, we're going to need oil and gas for the next 10 years. Agree. And the audience laughed their asses off because we're probably going to need it for like 80 years. Um, and here's, here's to the extent of how ridiculous that, that comment is. Um, and I'm not anti-Biden or hating on policy. I'm just talking. U.S. EV share reached 6% of all new vehicle sales last year. The goal is to reach 50% by 2030, which is seven years from now. But that's only new car sales. So even now, the number of EVs on the road in 2022 is 1%. 99% of the cars on the road require uh, gasoline. Um, the U.S. consumes 20 million barrels per day of petroleum products. Even a 10% decline in, the, in that number would only reduce consumption back to where we were in 2012. So obviously saying you want to put an end to fossil fuels is going to discourage investment and buybacks ain't going to have anything to do with it. You're, you're, you've got to make the oil and gas industry feel somewhat safe to keep investing or the prices are going up. It's one or the other. You can't have you can't really have both because EV adoption is just not going to get to where you want it to get to. No matter how many cars uh, Elon Musk makes, like we're just not going to get there soon enough. So that's the that's what got the biggest laugh and it wasn't a nice laugh. It was a very derisive howl uh, in State of the Union and I think it it did a lot to illustrate how out of touch some of the democratic policies are with the actual reality of what we need. So, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Just you be, missed it now. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be honest for my make the case. I, I, I forgot about it until 20, 20 minutes before the show. So listen, I did what I had to do. I'm going to make the case for Disney. I'm going to keep it simple. Uh, Disney is in better hands. Of course, the stock is acting better. I think momentum can ignite in two seconds. And I think I'm going to do something tomorrow that I should have done a while ago. I'm going to cut one of my losers mm. and I'm going to add to a winner. Okay. I like that. I'm going to sell Unphase energy, which I bought because it was breaking out and I just held it way too long. Did you buy that, this? That's on me. That's did you my buy bad. this for a trade originally or did you buy it no. for an investment? No, 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 no. Uh, I did not buy it for a trade. So I think, I think tomorrow I might, you know, it's not fun to add to a stock that's up 7%, but guess what? That's what a professional does. So are you at all worried about the uh, tourism and travel comps in the second half of this year? Yes. So 20% year over year. So absolutely. Oh, I don't know. They said that they're doing. They're going to build it out in an Avatar Park, which is going to be just a gigantic home run. Um, I'm happy to tell you that one of my days in Paris, I will be visiting Euro Disney for the first time. Thank you. Which I well, you want Disney in- now? What? Where? Do you want Disney? Do you want Disney the stock? No. Don't own it. I did. I I sold it. Uh, I've been informed that they don't call it Euro Disney anymore. They call it Disneyland Paris. Disney. (laughs) No, yeah, Disney. Disneyland Paris. I'm going. I'm going to go. So it's 45 minutes from. uh, It's 45 minutes from the heart of Paris. Supposed to be really easy to get there. Okay. um, So you know what's going to happen? It's just a barrage of of upgrades for Disney, right? Just. Uh. Yeah, it's because a lot of people have wanted to be bullish on this stock the whole yeah. way down. Yeah. It's they the most American thing you could do is drink Budweiser or no on Disney. Oh, great. All right, I have a mystery chart for you, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, da, 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 da. John? Okay, what in the world? Hold on. Come on. I want you okay. to Okay. Well, I, want you to, I want you to expand shh, your horizons. Shh, 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 shush your mouth. 1950. <laughs> <laughs> shut, shut, your, shut your mouth. All right, I, get, I, get, I need a clue. What? Okay. 
Um, this chart looks like the hair of one of those troll I, dolls. I shall give you a clue. Shut up and dribble. Shut up and dribble. Okay. Oh, this is LeBron. LeBron. Got it, got it, got it. The reveal, sir. Yeah. You know, you know what's kind of upsetting me as a Knicks fan? That mm-hmm. LeBron has been in the league for 18 seasons. And never played for us? No. That I don't care about. Never okay. once have I seen LeBron James play a game in Madison Square Garden that mattered. Not one time. That is really sad. It makes me upset. Um, because the Knicks were never in contention for anything when he was on Miami. Yeah. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's bad. 20, uh, 18 how years. About, how about until the scoring record? Uh, there really wasn't that much for Lakers fans to get excited about. What like do you mean? Those, with, well, they won a championship. They won, in the, they won in the bubble. Like, no, they, like nobody even got to know, experience those poor, that. Those poor Laker kind of shitty, fans. Right? Those poor, poor Laker fans. No, I, I'm, not, I'm not taking it that far. That's that's a little much. I just thought, all right, this was this was the thing that really blew my mind. Kareem, let's put that chart back up. So this is a fun interactive chart at the New York Times. So if you have time later, you could just scroll your mouse over and you could see like everybody that that's on this list. Kareem did 38,387 points with mm-hmm. one three-point shot. They introduced the three-point shot in 1979, halfway through his career, and he never took one. He took, they said he took, they said he took like three a season, and, and it was only, probably like a half court made, shot at the buzzer. And he, he only made one. That's that's bananas to me. And I'm not saying that that's an asterisk for LeBron. It was a different game. It was a very different time. It's not really comparable, but still, could, if you're Kareem, you're saying in the back of your head as you're watching. Live no, LeBron no, no, break no, your no. record. You're like, I ain't never had a three point. No, uh, no, no, no. You're Kareem not saying that. Not, no, he's seven. He was seven three. He's I not know. shooting threes. No, I know he's excited about it, but I'm just saying. Um, I'm just yeah. saying that's isn't that wild though? Mm. I would have thought. I would have thought he would have. The other thing that kind of screws up Kareem is he actually went to college. Something that you used to do. It was like standard for basketball players. If if they could get into college, they would go. And the last thing about Kareem is my dad. Played basketball against him in the Bronx. Really? That's kind of wild. He was Lou Alcindor, and he played for the best basketball high school in the Bronx. And my dad played for probably a team full of Jews and Italians. And <laughs> but they they had a game. So Kareem they, has they a Substack, and he actually wrote about about how he feels about LeBron beating him. And I have it open my tab, and I'm going to read it tonight. I'm sure it's extremely gracious because Kareem is class act. Yes, for sure. Um, There's no doubt. But he still, he did this with only two pointers, and that is nuts. That is nuts. So I guess the comeback is LeBron played against real athletes, and the NBA in the 70s was like, this is not. The, the Kareem's the best. This is the lead. I begin everything I write with a lot of apprehension because I know how hard it is to translate complex thoughts and intense emotions into the exact words that accurately express those thoughts and emotions. But this article I approach with True. even That's more why trepidation. I stopped tweeting. Yeah, he's great. He's great. Uh, I'm very excited to read this. Anyway, yeah. uh, listen, we're coming to Chicago. So you know where to find... What is it? Info at? Info at Red Holtz Wealth. If you have money, a financial plan, a portfolio, uh, doesn't matter really what level you're at. We're, we're, we're doing our best to see our fans and we'll be there for three days. So hit us up. Let us know if you think we can help you and you will be uh, scheduled or sent to the appropriate person and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do our best to, to get people on the schedule. And we're going to have some fun while we're in Chicago. I'm looking forward to it. What about you? Will there be food? Oh, my God. (laughs) So much food. All right, guys. Thanks so much for uh, tuning in. I hope you caught the new episode of Animal Spirits, which came out today. Uh, The Animal Spirits video will go up tomorrow. We're a day delayed. Uh, And new Compound and Friends at the end of the week. We love you. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.